Hi everyone, and thank you very much, Aaron, for the very kind invitation to speak at your course there in Glasgow. I'm very sorry I couldn't be there, but of course, as you may or may not know, we have quite draconian border restrictions in Australia, which will hopefully be relaxed in November so we can uh, travel once again. Um, Aaron's brief to me was about speaking regarding endoscopic e-surgery equipment and how you might get started in your hospital after this course. And I'll include a little bit about cost analysis because, of course, one of the major or hurdles in getting a, uh, beginning a technique in your hospital is with regards to the extra cost of the equipment. So I'll talk to you about how we got that across the line in Sydney. Now I'm coming to you from Sydney, Australia. This is my hospital, Royal North Shore Hospital, and we have a drainage area. We drain northern Sydney as a tertiary hospital, about one and a half million people, but we drain all the way up to the northern border of New South Wales. So some two and a half million people from a quaternary drainage point of view could consider North Shore their home hospital. And for any of you interested who are juniors in uh, in the course that Aaron's running, we do have a fellowship. And this is our fellow from last year, Horace Cheng. And he joined us last year. And this was during lockdown when there was no flights in and out of Sydney. And Dr. Nicholas Jufus, who's one of the members of our group, is a pilot. But one of our endoscopic ear surgery anaesthetists, Dr. Bill Bastic, on the right-hand side in the cockpit there, who was the actual pilot, treated us to some incredible views of Sydney where you can see it was quite crystal clear because there was no commercial flying and hardly any road travel. And we got these incredible views of Sydney that made even my jaw drop having lived there for so many years. But certainly we'd invite any surgeon, but particularly any junior surgeons who are interested in fellowships or observerships to come down to Sydney. Now, one other thing I'm very fortunate to have in my life is these two people, Arun, who's your course director, and Daniela, who's your international guest. And these two are quite significant giants in the endoscopic field, so you can consider yourselves quite lucky to uh, be in their presence. And I don't mean that in any, in any way in any disrespect, but Arun is quite a significant player in the endoscopic field and has done quite a lot of important work in quality of life analysis and interesting studies about equipment, and I'll share with you one or two of those. You can see this is the last time I saw Arun, and that was when he came to our course in September 2019. And you can see the top left of the screen, that's uh, Professor Adrian James, also a giant and a very significant player in endoscopic ear surgery. And the reason these these people are very important players is not just that they contribute significantly to the science, but they're very humble people. Probably one of the greatest giants in endoscopic ear surgery is Professor Marchioni. He, along with Livio Prasuti, have contributed probably the most in the last five to ten years in endoscopic ear surgery with their textbooks. And as you know, this is the last time I saw Daniele, actually. You may not know that, but this is the last time I saw him, which was in uh, January of last year at the South Korean Endoscopic Ear Surgery course run by Professor In Seok Moon. And you probably also know that Daniele is quite a Michelangelo. He does his own hand drawings for his textbooks, but you may not know his singing ability here. And he's also quite extraordinary with the uh, piano. But um, enough of the holiday video postcards. Let's get into the talk. And one of the things we speak about when you're beginning endoscopic ear surgery, and certainly those of you coming to the course may have only just begun your endoscopic journey, is that we want you to apply these techniques pretty well straight away. And you can do that with your own FES scope. So you have 4 millimeters, 0 and 30 and 45 degree functional endoscopic sinus surgery scopes. And these can be used quite appropriately in most ear canals, certainly more tricky in the pediatric ear canal. You can use your regular otology set. But one thing that we try and encourage you to do is try and get the best cameras and video setup that you can. So at least an HD, ideally a 4K camera system, and then the LED lighting. So typically hospitals in the past used to have halogen or xenon. And of course, these can be used for endoscopic ear surgery, but we prefer the LED light. It's just a cooler light, and the blue light tends to be quite nice in differentiating tissue. And you can set this lighting at below 50%. So one of the issues we had uh, early in endoscopic ear surgery in the 2014-2015 uh, 
was that we were very worried about heat transmission and Arun did a very clever study uh, randomizing and sending images to all of us around the world and demonstrated that if the light intensity is decreased it doesn't affect the image quality and modern day cameras self-regulate this anyway so this is some um, some work that Arun did showing that we can keep the light intensity low on the equipment which means that the heat intensity into the middle ear is less and we can get similar outcomes with our image quality now you can begin with this sort of a set, your typical otology set and your FES equipment, but then as you progress beyond some of the early endoscopic equipment or endoscopic cases, you'll generally be faced with acquiring dedicated endoscopic ear surgery equipment. And these are the two major players. This was produced by the International Working Group of Endoscopic Ear Surgery with Carl Stortz, and you can see the setup on the left hand side of the oh, sorry, on the right hand side of your viewing screen left I should say, the International Working Group, and the Spiegel and Thies, the Panetti set, also from a good friend and colleague of ours, Dr. Panetti from uh, Napoli in Italy. His set is quite nice in the sense that he has quite a lot of suction at the tip of his dissection instruments and they're also curved, but you have to be careful when you're beginning with his equipment because he has quite sharp tips to his equipment so you can quite easily in the first um, instance poke structures and you have to obviously be careful when you're poking near the stapes or near a dehiscent facial nerve so I caution you with that sort of equipment early in your endoscopic uh, journey but he does have these very nice reticulators which allows us to attach equipment to a sucker so that it curves quite nicely over the thinner um, uh, over in between your index finger and your thumb so that you can quite gently rest suction equipment as you're dissecting uh, in, in angled and confined areas within the middle ear. So you pick one of these two trays, or if you have enough money, both. But certainly if you're quite limited with your budget, then you can restrict yourself to quite a, just a handful of instruments that will really get you a long way with not just mesotympanic, but with attic dissection as well. And these are probably the real workhorses of the International Working Group set, which is the one that we prefer. We use a few pieces of equipment in Sydney from the Panetti set, particularly some of the uh, dissection uh, so the, the curved dissecting instruments and the reticulator that I showed you. But these short, medium and long Thomason dissectors really work quite nicely uh, for dissecting a lot of the pro tympanum, the retro tympanum and the attic that we talk about. And this double-ended uh, curator is also very nice for the lateral aspect of the scutum when you're dissecting a sack off and trying to do that in one go quite neatly. This is a very nice instrument for dissecting in that region as well as in the retro tympanum and uh, pro tympanum. So if you have a limited budget these are the type of uh, instruments that you'd be looking at and then of course as you progress these upturned and backwards turned and right and left cups and scissors are also very important when we're trying to do one-handed dissection. Carl Storz have recently updated their equipment and one of the problems we had with the first generation of suckers is that the metal meant that they were quite flexible and so they could get caught on structures and flick around in the middle ear and they've they've sort of fixed this now by improving the stability of the suckers and making them more conical in shape and so this is these are quite useful and you if you don't have enough money to have these you can certainly suck uh, certainly bend your own disposable suckers to a curved way and use those uh, when you're beginning but certainly as you progress you might want to uh, invest in some of these conical curved suckers. Of course your rigid scope is going to be one of the most important things and we've played around with different lengths and different diameters and it seems to be the sweet spot is a 2.7 or a 3 millimeter scope because this gives us the most range with adult and pediatric ears and these newer generation of Hopkins scopes um, they're dedicated and they're made for endoscopic ear surgery. They're around 14 centimeters in length and this seems to be an ideal length, somewhere between 12 and 14 centimeters, where you have enough length outside the canal but you can place instruments adjacent to the scope so that you don't hit and conflict if you're using a shorter examination otoscopy uh, that we used in the in the rooms. And so if you're looking to buy this equipment, we generally start with a 0, a 30, and a 45 degree endoscope. You typically don't need the 70 degree endoscope in endoscopic ear surgery. One of the tips we have when we're teaching our registrars here in Sydney is that um, the scope is of course very important when you've got these narrow canals. And you can see a pediatric canal in a three-year-old with a retrotympanic cholesteatoma and the difficulty you have with a collapsing canal in the pediatric environment. So here we need to be very careful and of course the four millimeter scope is going to be quite difficult in a pediatric ear. And you can see here when you're beginning how you can damage 
the canal wall when you're entering in with a 45 degree scope. So you have to, when you're entering in with the 30, 45 degree scope, Aaron and Daniela will show you, but you have to be very careful when you're entering those scopes into the canal and you tend to insert towards the bottom of the scope so that you don't get these abraded anterior canal walls like I did when I was uh, beginning. This is some, a video from uh, some six or seven years ago and try and avoid the 70 degree scope. As you progress with endoscopic ear surgery beyond tympanoplasty and in, into the attic, and this is one of the major strengths of the endoscope that Aaron will talk about, there's several different bone, bone removal techniques we have, and the curate is the cheapest and, and one of the safest ways of removing, and Aaron will show you, and Daniela will show you the overhand as well as the underhand method of uh, using the curette. But then, of course, you can use the drill in a dry way with just some gentle irrigation in this sense. And one of the major changes that we've seen is with uh, these self-irrigating burrs that have just come out from Medtronic. So this was with the older burr on the right-hand screen here. And you can I was just generally dropping the rotation speed to around 10,000 and just gently irrigating so you don't get blood splattered everywhere. Um, but these... MRHs, these actually self-irrigate, and I'll show you how we use that in Sydney. Um, there's also the Yamagata bone chisel. We have this tray in Sydney. This is from Seiji Kakahata's group in Yamagata, and they have these absolutely precisely created instruments that rapidly remove the sputum and the attic. But you can see here our fellow and our registrar using the technique here. It's two-handed technique in the sense that we generally have the surgeon holding the endoscope and the chisel and then an assistant tapping and uh, this can be a very useful method of course if you're skilled in it. Um, one thing that I've started doing a little bit more in Sydney with drilling is and I'm not sure if this is the correct method or not but it's something that you might want to consider and that's using Hartmann's or ringers at body temperature with an endo scrub and this allows us to of course get rid of all of the bone dust and when you have a clean sac like this so when you know what the limits of your cholesteatoma are it can be a very nice way of dissecting and of course a very nice way of drilling because you can place these MR8 self-irrigating burrs in underwater and you can have this now at 60 or 75,000 revs and very quickly remove the attic bone. And there is an advantage to doing this with the endoscope compared to the microscope because you can get that extra few degrees of angulation in drilling on that sputum which with an angle scope makes a very big difference in how far you can see and also do. So this is one thing you may want to try. Professor uh, Marchioni is a real master of the piezo surgery method, and this is low frequency ultrasonic waves creating micro vibrations to remove bone and theoretically not damage soft tissue. And there's certainly been some discussion of this in the literature for the, over the last 12 to 14 years. And one of the issues that um, has been brought up in the past is the effect on hearing and whether there's any major issues with piezo surgery on hearing. And you can see some published experiences showing no significant damage in human specimens uh, using the piezo surgery, but some uh, animal models suggesting that there could be damage when directly drilling on the cochlea. And here uh, you saw the picture of Adrian James when he joined us in September 2019 at our Sydney course. And here's some work from his lab in Toronto showing that if we use the piezo on the ossicles, it may affect cochlear structure fun and function and this is in the animal model. So I think when you're beginning and you're using the piezo surgery, use it by all means but use it with caution around the acicular chain. Of course Daniela uses it very effectively to remove the cochlea and we've also got some videos of that um, and that's a completely different environment because when you're removing the cochlea you're expecting to of course damage the uh, hair cells. Now the extras, if you can, are quite useful and one of the things that we use quite a lot and there are many ways of reducing bleeding and we'll talk about this in, in, the, in the upcoming slides is uh, using neuropathies and these are all ideas that we got from uh, seeing different people around the world but now all of us in Sydney use these neuropathies um, and of course you're very familiar with neuropathies and neuropathy sizes but we use the quarter by quarter or half by half uh, neuropathies. If the canal is big enough, we use half by half, and this is a method that Daniela taught us where if you have a slightly bigger oversized neuropathy, and we typically leave the string on because it allows you to pull the neuropathy out relatively easily and reduce the uh, timing or speed and improve the speed of the surgery. Um, so neuropathies are quite beneficial, but there's many different ways of using it. You can have speed balls, but the difficulty with those is that they can't be identified postoperatively or they don't have a radio label tag on them, so we tend to avoid those. 
These low profile blue Lone Star hooks are quite useful and I'll show you how we use those in our setup and of course Antifog is quite useful as well um, and we'll show you the setup in Sydney of how we do that. If you do have extra money then of course lasers been demonstrated from John Hamilton's work in the UK to significantly reduce residual uh, rates of disease and Adrian's published quite a lot on this and you can see in some of his work just published recently in 2020 he's shown us how he sets up a malleable sucker to suck as we go on the endoscope and this is the method I use actually Adrian told us about this many years ago, um, attaching the sucker to the KTP laser. And this allows us to extract the smoke at the same time as we generate the smoke with either a CO2 KTP or argon laser. When you're beginning, of course, bleeding is the major issue. And so we've Im imported a lot of these methods from endoscopic sinus surgery. And in Australia, PJ Warmold is sort of the king of this uh, some 10, 12 years ago, and he did some of the original animal and sheep work on trying to Im maintain cerebral perfusion and reduce bleeding in functional endoscopic sinus surgery. So we use a similar method of total intravenous anesthesia with sevoflurane and try, of course, it's very hard to keep maps and uh, mean arterial pressures and pulse rates this low, but try and keep your pulse rate as well as your mean arterial pressure as low as possible because this will actually improve your bleeding or reduce your bleeding. This is the sort of setup we have in Sydney for a totally endoscopic setup. You can see on the left hand side of the screen a totally endoscopic setup. We want to have a little bit of reverse Trendelenburg, slight head up and importantly not too much head rotation. If we over rotate the head then we can compress the contralateral sigmoid sinus and theoretically increase the return bleed venous blood flow in the ipsilateral side. So try not to over rotate the neck. Of course if we're doing a combined case where there's a disease extending into the antrum and into the mastoid then this is the setup we have with um, appropriate head rotation but importantly for children generally under the age of 12 we put a shoulder roll under the shoulders because this will allow us to obviate the occipital protuberance that a child has and if the child has an occipital protuberance then they tend to flex the neck if you just rest them on a, a, um, a head ring and so then the facial nerve instead of being parallel to the floor in a consistent drilling direction when compared to the adult it may be tipped more medially or more laterally depending on how much head extension and flexion you have from the occipital protuberance so we generally put a shoulder roll back and this will extend the child's neck and allow us to have a more horizontal facial nerve parallel to the floor so that we have more consistent drilling and then we have straps as well for the table with no reverse Trendelenburg in that setup this is the sort of endoscopic ear setup that we have in Sydney um, we typically have these three Lone Star retractors, one on the tragus, one in the posterior superior quadrant, and then uh, one often in the anti-helix, and ensuring when you have these Lone Stars not to place them over the orbital socket, and then we place uh, our antifog to the side of the ear because we don't want the ototoxic antifog dripping into the ear and then a little micro wipe to protect the antitragus so that you don't get pressure on the antitragus and so then the scope goes onto the antifog a quick wipe onto the micro wipe which just cleans the, the screen just slightly to try and improve your view and then as you can see we pop an otowick into the ear with one in a thousand adrenaline or neuropathies and we do the hair cutting and I typically use as you can see in this video a lemon oral speculum and I just stretch it in four directions and use a long baluchi from lateral to medial to cut the hair and this is a very important part initially of uh, endoscopic ear surgery because rubbing the hairs can really frustrate you in your first 10, 15, 20 cases. You lose the view and the major advantage of the endoscope. Um, with a combined setup you can see that we have the microscope and in general we have the microscope for most of our uh, setups here and you can see the microscope is all prepped and draped for a combined setup next and we ha we're lucky enough to have an integrated setup so we can switch between screens left and right and so you can see here our registrar from a couple of years ago um, able to switch uh, with the endoscope and then the microscope quite easily. If you have the capacity, there are several brands. We use the Striker brand that has armrests. This is quite well established in otologic surgery. And these can be quite useful, particularly when you're beginning. Um, but just be careful not to externally rotate your shoulders too much because this can have strain on your neck. And we're trying to do some research on that at the moment in Sydney on um, ergonomics in uh, in 
microscopic and endoscopic ear surgery. But one other thing we talk about with ergonomics is how you can, in the with the endoscope, actually stand. And if you go and actually visit Daniele, which I've done quite a lot of, you'll see that because he's not just a, a lateral skull base surgeon, but he's also an anterior skull base surgeon and a head and neck surgeon, he stands for most of his endoscopic ear surgery. And this gives us a very nice neutral position for our cervical spine and our thoracic spine because it puts our shoulder girdles into a neutral position. So when you're, st uh, w when you're sitting down and doing endoscopic ear surgery, it's ideal deal for the mesotympanum and the protympanum because you have a natural view anteriorly but when you want to look at the retrotympanum consider standing and even consider look going to the contralateral side and this is a method that Daniela taught us some six or seven years ago and if you stand it means that you can actually move your body towards the disease so if you're dis dissecting in the anterior epitympanum you can stand and position yourself so that your shoulder girdle and your hand movements are more natural in that direction so consider standing as well for endoscopic ear surgery when you're beginning some of the early tips are one of the most important things is to add time to your operating list don't stress yourself out by trying to fit what you normally do in a microscopic list with an endoscopic list give yourself an extra 30 minutes or 60 minutes for the case so that you can actually slow down have the microscope ready and as I mentioned to you trim the hair carefully a proper injection is very important when you're starting and this is the method I use I use 1% ropivacaine because it has a naturally um, vasoconstrictive effect one slow injection point in the vascular strip can quite easily blanch the whole ear canal quite nicely I, I bend the 25 gauge needle or the 27 gauge needle and we keep the bevel down towards the bone and as you inject you watch to see it all blanching and I mix my 1% ropivacaine to about 1 in 50,000 adrenaline to get nice um, nice vasoconstriction and then often put an auto wick or a, a neuropathy with one in a thousand adrenaline on top of there that may or may not diffuse through the epithelium but it might improve the bleeding it tends to give us quite good results when you're um, beginning bleeding is so important that if you get a lot of bleeding with your tympanomiatal flap we find a lot of the established microscopic surgeons will often abandon endoscopic ear surgery and just use it as an inspection tool and lose the benefits of the transcanal method with the endoscope so I encourage you not to give up too early with the tympanomiatal flap consider the anesthetic um, the neuropathies and the injection as I mentioned you can do bipolar cautery with a Colorado needle with a very low settling I mean of course we have to be very careful in the post row inferior quadrant where the facial nerve is can potentially be near the external auditory canal and Daniela uses this very effective uh, piece of equipment we don't have in Australia called the Vesilius and that seems to give them very nice technique of doing like a, a button by monopolar around the flap before incising which reduces the bleeding and of course saline wash can be very beneficial sometimes warm saline wash very beneficial and the micro bipolar particularly on the lateral aspect of the flap because you can bipolar the medial aspect but often that doesn't bleed much but it's the lateral aspect particularly post row inferior that tends to continue to bleed so you can use a bipolar there some of the tips that we found in our first few cases in Sydney was that we found that we were battling too much with the endoscope method so you find that when you start with the endoscope you want, you're so enthusiastic about it you want to actually just keep going keep going and dissect out that antral cholesteatoma and if you can't you can see here one of the early videos of me almost certainly digging into a cholesteatoma here and you can see it's not a nice clean sac that's coming out so if you're finding that there's a lot of blood like this you're not around a nice clean sac then just do the patient a favor hopefully have already prepared postericularly but just do the cortical mastoidectomy and you'll find more often than not that there's a lot more disease in the antrum than you expect so in Sydney now we when we're dissecting in the sort of posterior epitympanum or the retrotympanum we just tell the nursing staff to set a 10 minute clock and we try and get into a nice dissection plan and if we're not in a nice dissection plan within 10 minutes and we're just fluffing around with blood and taking piecemeal cholesterol around then we'll switch to doing a cortical mastoidectomy the other thing is overdoing the atacotomy and this is one of the things that we nice now find that when we're doing too big an atacotomy it's the reconstruction that's the problem you can see this is a right ear and uh, we've removed the disease but you can see it's quite a large atacotomy so now I don't go beyond about six millimeters beyond that reconstruction becomes quite difficult and we can get a prolapsing of the attic cartilage be which becomes quite problematic here uh, this is a technique that um, 
Daniele Torres, and you can see here I'm on the contralateral side now, dissecting into the um, into the posterior epitympanum in the antrum and this is where it's an ideal technique when you have this nice clean method where you can see we're dissecting it around the sac there's not a lot of bleeding you can see that we haven't torn the sac at all and if you can do that and pull the sac out quite gently from the contralateral side try it not all of us like that tech this technique in Sydney but I certainly like it in certain situations and I learned this method from Daniela but it's quite a useful method for um, looking at the retro tympanum and posterior epitympanum. Beyond that when we uh, go past this we can get into the sort of situation where you're trying to stabilize if you're doing a mastoidectomy sometimes looking at the lateral aspect of the anterior epitympanum can be quite difficult with the microscope and so often you put the endoscope in you can see here we stabilize that sometimes with a sponge or a ray tech so that it doesn't wobble over the sigmoid sinus that's another little tip when you're beginning your endoscopic work one major thing I found is that when you have combined disease you think that you just want to go back to the old Sheehy method and just lift up the vascular strip and just get in the um, self-retaining retractor and just get in and do the mesotympanic and adequate cholesteatoma with the microscope but I encourage you to try and do it all with the endoscope the mesotympanic and attic component and just the mastoidectomy with the microscope and the reason is I think that you are because you're avoiding and you're avoiding lifting up the canal skin you're getting a better vascularization of the of the healing canal and you get much quicker return to function you can see with this image at the bottom of the screen the actual incision line that we've got here and this patient will return to the water much quicker I think than if you um, lifted up that vascular strip and I think that small point is quite an important point with better healing and quicker return to water so once you when you've got your endoscopic setup you of course need to progress in an appropriate manner and one of the methods of improving your endoscopic skills in a live patient after you've finished in Aaron's lab is to obviously take your time with these early cases but start with simple cases like this using inserting grommets with an endoscope can could be quite a good early method then you can progress onto these simple sort of posterior perforations and remember to take your time to take your time to clean the wax out of the ear canal this is a very nice way of improving your hand-eye coordination and when you're rimming the perforation slow down so that you learn the hand-eye coordination better than if you're rushing around and making uh, injuries in the canal but you can move on with these nice cases of you can see a poster of perforation here and using a nice underlay technique to repair these perforations this would be a very easy technique to do transcanal microscopically but when you're beginning it might be quite nice to do this endoscopically and you get a very nice view particularly of the graft placement anteriorly and then we can move on to these sort of perforations that are slightly more anterior this is with a 30 degree endoscope um, and you can get these 1.9 millimeter arthroscopes that in a child in a child sort of where they've got those tiny ear canals you can get a very lovely view of the protympanum. You can see the subtensor recess here in the protoniculum, the cochlear carotid recess. Very nice views of this. This is a five or six year old child. Quite classic scenario with extensive tympanosclerosis around grommet after grommet insertion. And then we fashion using tragal cartilage a very nice button. And this can be placed in very easily with the endoscope. And this becomes a 20 minute um, moringoplasty that can be quite easily done. And 60, 70 percent of the time can. Um, work very nicely to seal up the ear and you know, give the child a waterproof ear with almost no effect on hearing and you can see you can get very nice views of this cartilage button going into place and you'll see how it locks into position there quite nicely just there and very nice healing that it can occur in, in 60 70 80 percent of cases in this sort of scenario it doesn't always work but of course when it does you get some excellent results in terms of healing from there we can progress on to anterior uh, perforations and I'm sure Aaron and you'll be getting some talks on this in, in upcoming lectures. When you're moving on to cholesteatoma it's very important to look at your um, selection of cases and of course the main thing you want to work out in your rooms is is the disease going to require a totally endoscopic approach? Do you need to do any canal widening with a postricular incision or an endoral incision and do you need to do mastoidectomy? And one of the major changes 
um, for me was looking at this, y getting an endoscope in the rooms and using the endoscope in the rooms to assess the patient. And what we do is we place the endoscope at the bony cartilaginous junction and look at the extent of the disease. So you can see on the left-hand side of the screen that we have a posterior perforation with epithelium extending well towards the anterior annulus and that we've got a significant antero-inferior and inferior bony overhang. So there's a suspicion of needing to do a canal plaster here. But when we assess the canal at the bony cartilaginous junction with a zero degree scope, we can see the burden of the disease in this right hand image is more in the posterior superior quadrant and, uh, and, and in the superior aspect in the attic. And so we should be able to access this totally endoscopically. And so getting the endoscope in your rooms, using it as the primary method of examination for the patients, not only allows you to work out whether these cases can be done totally endoscopically, but it really engages the patient very nicely in the patient journey. And you'll find that they um, will really love this part of, uh, part of the examination. And then of course, we move on to CT scanning. And if we're trying to work out if it's totally endoscopic, then we need to ensure that it's not beyond the lateral semicircular canal because this is just an equipment limitation getting around the corner. We want to make sure that there's no deep type C sinus tympani because this means that we can't reach the disease again transcanal and then we need to perform a, a, a mastoidectomy and a retrofacial dissection sometimes using the endoscope to dissect off the medial aspect of the facial nerve and when you're beginning be careful of cases like this you can see a, a coronal image of a CT scan left ear and you can see the cholesteatoma eroding into the lateral semicircular canal and quite a significant tegment erosion. This is not the sort of case that you tackle first with endoscopic ear surgery. So your first endoscopic cases should be nice wide ear canals, uninfected ears, disease that's not extending past the lateral semicircular canal, no deep type C sinus tympani and no complications at all. So you can see some examples here. This four-year-old child with lovely attic disease in the attic and they have a big petrosquamous sinus connecting from the sigmoid sinus all the way to the cavernous sinus and in a four-year-old if you hit that with the canal wall up or canal wall down it would be quite a significant problem and then this one was a uh, adult actually with congenital cholesteatoma behind an intact drum a perfect case for endoscopic when you're beginning so these again uh, are good totally endoscopic cases that we've spoken about now, just in conclusion, let me talk, share with you the story of how we actually got endoscopic ear surgery or get, got our sets for endoscopic ear surgery across the line in Sydney. Now, this is a picture of Macquarie University Hospital where the first totally endoscopic ear surgery work was done in Australia when uh, I came back in 2012. And at that time, we had the functional endoscopic with the FES equipment and we had the standard otology set and we were doing cases and we wanted to buy the international working group set which in fact the rep in Australia didn't know existed and of course one of the major barriers you have when you approach the CEO is the cost of the extra equipment and what's the business case for it and so we had to give them some information on what the business case is and so we studied after a year or so after we'd established a learning curve and these are there's two assumptions for this study that we did where we compared the uh, retrospective historical cohort of canal wall up disease versus sim slim, similar radiological burden on endoscopic cases where we did specifically just attic cholesteatoma and we compared the two for a direct cost comparison but the two things you have to assume for our study is that we've that I've achieved the learning curve when I was comparing these two and from well-established otologic models where we have well-established reliable anatomy, for example, stapedectomy and acoustic neuroma and cochlear implant, we know that it's about 50 cases. Once you've done 50 cases in these otolo otology setups, you get pretty similar um, complications and similar outcomes. And we have to assume once we've reached that learning curve that the residual recurrence rates are similar, which we now know is the case and likely even better than canal wall up and approaching canal wall down for um, cholesteatoma. So we've, we've, uh, we're happy with that goal, but we have to assume these two things. And what we did was compare 10 canal wall up historically results with endoscopic ear surgery. And what we looked at was the patient journey. And we wanted to look at the patient when they got admitted into hospital, all the direct costs for that, and this includes theater time, nursing time, admission time, costs of the nurses there, discharge time afterwards, and in the past, I used to keep um, some of my patients 
overnight but to keep the cost comparison more similar we included some of the ones that we did day surgery as well as overnight and we looked at the whole patient journey for the direct cost. So this is not the indirect cost. So this is not what Aaron's published on in the uh, recently where we were talking about quality of life improvements where you can assume endoscopically that there'll be less pain typically and this is getting proved more and more often. And uh, I think Aaron's just recently pub or is looking, he was talking to me about he was talking, doing some pain research as well and there seems to be a trend towards less pain with endoscopic ear surgery. But also that um, a quicker return to work. So there may be less time off work with endoscopic ear surgery. This is discounting any of those costs. It's looking just at the patient journey. And we found that there was a nearly 16, 1,600 um, pound reduction per case. And this was mainly because in Australia we have to use disposable burrs um, for our mastoidectomies and the burr cost is quite significant, up to $200 a burr. And then after you've achieved the learning curve, there's a significant time reduction because of course you don't have to open the, the ear and then you don't have to of course close the ear. So there's about a 42 minute time reduction we found when comparing these two co co cohorts. And then if you extend that out, conservatively talking about a surgical career of approximately 30 years with 25 cases if you were doing these type of cholesterol cases a year, then conservatively we can look at around a 1.2 million pound cost reduction for the hospital for one surgeon for one operation. So of course money talks and um, we very quickly got the equipment and then ran our first courses uh, in Sydney from there. So in summary Get started quickly with your own hospital FES equipment and your own autology equipment. Take some time and slow down for the bleeding and the tympanomiatal flap. And really, once you get over those first 20, 30 cases, you'll find the benefits, the quality of life benefits, particularly for children. I think for children, we've, we've not really thought about it as a big deal, or at least I didn't autologically until I started seeing more and more parents coming back. And of course, the first thing patients look at is whether they've got a scar or not and whether they've got a head bandage or not after a, an otologic procedure. and um, It's a really significant quality of life improvement, particularly for our pediatric patients. And there's significant um, patient, and I think cost savings for the whole system, whole healthcare system in general, uh, when you start to include more endoscopic surgery in your work. So once again, Aaron, thank you very much for uh, the kind opportunity to speak at your course. One thing I strongly encourage you to do is after you've done your first 15, 20, 30 cases, come back and see, watch an experienced surgeon, come back and see Aaron doing his surgery in the UK. I um, took quite a lot of time and spent many weeks or a month and a half nearly in Verona. And this is a picture I took in Verona with, uh, with Professor Marchioni and certainly you'll uh, not regret spending time with Daniele. And of course, we hope to see you next December in Kyoto at our fourth World Congress, Innovations in Ear Surgery. So we're expanding it beyond endoscopic ear surgery, looking at innovations, including uh, robotic surgery, exoscopic surgery, um, uh, small molecule delivery into the uh, inner ear. And we hope to share all of this knowledge and catch up with our friends once again in Kyoto at the end of next year. So once again, Aaron, thanks again for the very kind invitation and I hope to see you all live soon someday sometime thanks again bye